a fiction by his blood i have been set free i believe in the resurrection hallelujah his life is destiny All praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome, the King who was and is and evermore will be, in Jesus' mighty
wonderful things. And I don't know what you caught, bring, brought in with you today. We all brought in something, something that we've been carrying throughout the week. But I want to tell you, the king of all glory is here and wants to do a miracle in your life. He wants to do something that will set you free, that will change your life. And you are here, I believe, by divine appointment. If you've tuned in on the other side of that camera, I want to tell you, this is not an accident that you've tuned in today. God has something special for you today. So Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much for who you are, for what you have done, and what you have planned for us today. 
Thank you so much for every individual, every family that's represented in the room and on the other side of that camera. Lord, I pray that you would bless them in beautiful ways. Open our hearts to receive the word. Believe that you have something special for us and help us to step into obedience, to respond in the way that pleases you. And we pray this in the name that's above every name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Hey, turn to your neighbor, give him a high five. Welcome to church. Hey, listen, can you, can you take the iPad screen? So welcome to Victory Church. My name is Joel. I'm so glad to see you. I'm uh, one of the associate pastors here. We're going to meet our, our lead pastors in just a moment. And uh, so, so grateful that you're here. We're one church in many communities and if you're a guest with us for the first time today, or maybe the first time in a long time, or maybe if you're a, uh, someone who's been attending but you haven't filled out a Connect card, hey, can we, we put our hands together for our guests today? Would you go ahead and do that? And on behalf of Victory Church, we just want to, we would like to, if you're a guest, to like, take your phone out and hover over that, that, uh, that uh, QR code that's right there. We would like to donate $5 to one of our local partners, and we want to partner with you in helping you make a difference uh, around the world. And so grateful. Go ahead, and, go ahead and start that process if you're a guest with us today. Hey, Reframe Conference is right around the corner. Any Reframe ladies here? Okay, a couple, couple I hear. Okay, that's good. I'm, I'm going to tell you what, it's going to be super, super exciting. Coming up on May 17th and 18th, uh, author and podcaster Rebecca Lyons is going to be speaking along with the mom of the house, Pam Seberg. It's just going to be an amazing, amazing time. Stop at the Next Steps area and make sure that you sign up for that. Uh, Align Life Ministry is in the house today. And can I encourage you? Hey, this is one of our partners. They do such great work. Angie, she's right down front. She's going to be in the lobby afterwards. Can I just stop by, say hello? And uh, they've got a Move for Life event coming up on May 11th. And I'd love for you to do that. Summer group leader it, training is right around the corner because we're going to be launching into our summer groups. It's what a wonderful opportunity. That's going to happen May 5th during the first service. We're re getting ready to join all of our other locations for, uh, for the message today. So turn your eyes to the screens and let's see what else is happening at Victory Church. What's going on, Victory Church? Hey, I'm Howie, and this is Carrie, and we've got an exciting outreach opportunity to share with you. Even if you don't think going on an outreach trip is something you're interested in, we encourage you to keep listening because this is an awesome opportunity to make a difference close to home. Yes, this summer, we are sending a team for the second summer in a row to serve with our friends at the Ability Tree Camp. Ability Tree Camp is an overnight camp for adults with disabilities and it's hosted close by in Stevens, PA at Refreshing Mountain. While the program is catered around the needs and level of the campers, it is an impactful experience for counselors and staff as well. While serving a camp, you will serve as a mentor to the campers, help them with their daily needs, and just be a friend and hey, everyone can do that. This trip is open to both adults and students ages 14 and up. So this is an amazing opportunity where parents and teenagers can serve together. Victory's team will be serving at Ability Tree Camp from July 7th through July 12th. If Ability Tree Camp sounds interesting to you, we encourage you to join the interest meeting on May 26th. Coming to the interest meeting does not mean you're committing to the trip. It just means you want to learn more. So you can sign up for the interest meeting at the Next Steps area after the service or scan that QR code on the seat back in front of you. Thank you, Tribe, for always being willing to make a difference. That's all we have for you today, which means it's time for today's message. Are you ready, Howie? I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. How about all of you? Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> hey, welcome, everybody. It's good to see you guys. Welcome, welcome. Come on, keep your hands together. Would you welcome all of our locations that are joining us right now? So glad to have you guys. 
Man, I'm driving in this morning, and one of the great things I love to do is listen to JTL on the drive-in and the praise music. I mean, I'm just like cranking that up in my truck. I think I'm blowing my speakers. I'm just cranking that thing. Man, there's nothing like it. And so we want to welcome all you guys and everybody who's listening on JTL, watching online. Thrilled to have you guys with us today. What a beautiful day, huh? Hey, before we get going today, we're in a series called 27. Uh, we're going to actually be taking a break from that, and I'll tell you, be, I'll tell you why in just a moment. But uh, Pam and I just want to start out this morning by just praying a prayer of blessing over top of everyone. Is that good? Yeah. Amen. Come on, would you bow your heads with me and let's pray together. Lord, we pray, Lord, a blessing would be upon the ears of every single listener today. Lord, as your word goes out, I pray that it would take seed in our heart. Lord, and that it would grow a harvest of growth and godliness and fruit of the Spirit in our life today. Would you do it, Lord? Bless everyone today who is here and that is listening to your anointed word. In your name we pray. Everyone said? Amen. 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 God bless you. Thanks, honey. So today we have a special guest with us who is no stranger to our church. Uh, ben, um, I consider him a close friend. I don't know if he considers me a close friend or not, but I certainly do consider him a very close friend and, and such a beautiful friend of our church. Also, he leads the ministry House of Resurrection that we have partnered with as a church to help marriages be resurrected and ministers be resurrected and men be resurrected from sexual addictions. It is an amazing ministry that we get to be a part of. And Blaine is here with us today. And so would you put your hands together for our friend, Blaine Bartell. Come on, everybody. It's good to have you. you Go get him, bro. Love you, man. Thank you, <laughs> Good morning. Oh, it's good to be here. It's good to be back in Pennsylvania when it's warm. Amen. I'm uh, wrapping my Cowboys blue. Uh, this, yeah, I've. You know, Kurt and I are, we're strong Cowboys fans. We're faithful. We endure till the end. We know they'll never win again, but hey, we're going to keep cheering them on. At least we're not Steeler fans. Come on. <laughs> or Philly. Come on. All right. Let's get off of that and on to Jesus. How about that? All right. So I just, uh, I think the main reason I'm super, super uh happy I can be here this morning is to say thank you. Um, when I got a call from Pastor Kurt uh, sometime near the end of December, 1st of January, I knew that you were giving an offering to our House of Resurrection project. Uh, but I, you know, and I'm, I was super grateful for that, but I, I had no idea when he called me the amount that it would be. And when he said that you all had given $50,000 to this project, I, I mean, literally fell out of my chair. I was like, Pastor Kurt, I don't even know how to respond to that. That gift literally put us over the finish line. And uh, so we are... We are just a couple months away from opening uh, in July. We, uh, we, we just have a little bit of work uh, left to do in the interior and some of the uh, property, uh, property work, but it is going to be open. And for those who don't know what it is, it'll be the, the first gospel-centered residential uh, sexual addiction uh, facility and program uh, in the country. In the country, and uh, we, uh, because I've been a pastor all of my life, and I have my own uh, story of coming out of uh, pornography and sexual addiction, my, pa my, my highest passion and heart is to help to uh, raise up and uh, uh, healthy pastors. Amen. And we have so many pastors uh, that are struggling with this crisis right now. I literally get a call every week or an email or a text from either a pastor or somebody saying, will you help our pastor or you, will you help this friend of mine who is a pastor? And so uh, we work with pastors, we work with men, uh, we work with marriages. And a part of uh, the reason we wanted to pay this off and not do a loan, not have any debt is because we're opening it up to ministers and pastors at, at no cost. 
Because usually when a pastor is in crisis, the last thing they have is, is a bunch of money. Usually they're in trouble financially. Uh, and, and, and to be honest, uh, when I went to a, a residential treatment center, which wasn't a, a gospel-centered uh, program uh, 14 years ago, it was $30,000. So this is going to be a blessing to leaders, to pastors, uh, to men, and to marriages. And the best thing about it is the, uh, the industry standard for recovery in this area is 20%. So one year later, after men and in some cases women have spent thousands of dollars on this programming, one year later, uh, only two out of ten are still, still living free from, from that world. Eight out of ten fall right back. Our, uh, our, we don't call it recovery, we call it resurrection. <laughs> our resurrection rate is at about 80%. So eight out of ten guys. And uh, I know we're not perfect. <laughs> I'd like it to be 100%, but even Jesus had Judas. So, I mean, there's, uh, there's always one or two that just don't do the work. But um, we're excited about that. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, every one of you. Our text this morning is from Isaiah 61. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. This is the text that Jesus used to announce his mission. And it's a beautiful text. The title of the message today is, When the World is on Fire. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel or the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of prison to those that are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God. Comfort to all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress or crown instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Lord, bless your word today. We open our hearts to receive what you have to say to us in Jesus' name. Amen. I laid my head on my pillow uh, about a year and a half ago. It was about 11.30 at night. Uh, Lori had, uh, was laying beside me. She had just gone to sleep maybe 30 minutes before. So I'm lying on my pillow, and my head's kind of turned, and I'm looking uh, towards the window in our backyard. And uh, at the time, we were living on uh, a property that had uh, several acres. And so I'm looking out to the backyard, and I'm just about to sleep, and and there's blinds on the window. And out of the corner of the window, I'm thinking I see a fire. Pretty sure there's a fire, a little bit of flames. And you have to understand me, I love to sleep. And I was nearly asleep. And so I'm looking out, and I'm seeing this, this fire And I'm beginning to kind of figure out what am I going to do about this. And I'm actually debating on whether I'm going to get up and find out what it is. So you have to know something about me. I am a get-it-done guy, but not always right away. So (laughs) my love language is no deadlines. I will get it done, but maybe not necessarily in good time. And so I'm, I'm justifying, I'm thinking, oh, maybe my, my neighbor Josh is grilling, you know, uh, or yeah, it's probably a fire, but it'll go out, you know, and, and, or maybe I'm dreaming, maybe there is no fire, just go to sleep. But finally, I look over at my wife, Lori, who does not like things done poorly, and who I know if it is a fire and I don't get up, I, I'm going to pay so I'm looking at her sleeping. I think I, I better get up. So I get up. I 
literally go out of the house in my pajamas, and there is a fire. It's bigger, way, way bigger than I thought. This wall of fire is literally moving on our grass in our backyard area. It has come from a quite a distance away, and it's moving closer and closer. It's about 10 feet from our wooden porch. And so, I mean, there's no time to lose. And it's dark. It's 1130 at night. We are like 10 miles away from a fire department. There's no calling anybody or getting any help at this moment. It is all on me. And so I immediately took out my, my, my phone and snapped a picture. Because <laughs> I couldn't lose this moment. Like, I thought, I may not make it, but I, I want to I record this. So I, I, did bring a, I did bring a picture. There it is. Yeah, there it is. There's... Yeah, right up there. That, that may have been it. That may have, it's somewhat like the picture I took. So I'm freaking out. This blaze is seconds away from consuming everything I own. And so I run and I quickly think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get the garden hose. And the garden hose is attached. So I get the garden hose, I attach it, uh, I, 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 I run, and it's not long enough. I can't reach it. it the garden hose is on the, on the other side of the house. So I go and get a second garden hose and attach it. The fire's still burning. It's getting closer. I attach it to the second garden hose, and it's still not long enough. So I run into the garage. I get a third garden hose, attach that, and finally I make it. And then I realize I have not turned the water on. So i got to run all the way back, turn the water on, and, man, I just start spraying that wall of fire. I, I'm like a gangster firefighter just going for it. Uh, and I realized as, as this fire began to be put out that in that moment I'd, I'd become the person I'd always wanted to be, the, the, the hero that I'd always wanted to be. I, I was truly a first responder. <laughs> Any firefighters in here? Yeah. You and I, we know what's going on. Yeah, we take care of stuff. So I put it out. I don't even wake Lori up. Don't even wake her up. Just go right back to bed. The whole thing's out. Uh, I kind of walk over and see where it started. It started in my neighbor's yard. It had literally burned through our, our fence. It divided our property, burned through our wood fence. And on the other side, there's just like a bunch of metal where it started. I didn't know what it was, just a bunch of metal. I thought, I don't know what, I thought maybe it was an air conditioner or something like that or furnace. I don't know. So um, I, I call him the next morning. I say, Josh, there was a fire and it started on your side of the yard. I and, and he, he ran out, and he looked. I said, oh, my goodness. He came out, and he said, oh, plain, oh, no. He said, that's where my wife put our chicken coop. And she put a heater in the chicken coop to keep the little chicks warm. I said, no. How many were? He said, seven. Seven little chicks were in that little heater. Now listen, I, I would like to tell you that all of the chicks made it out, okay? I'd like to tell you that, but, but I can't. Um, they all passed. And here's, here's what was crazy. Josh, my neighbor, was more concerned about the chicks than the fact that we almost died. I'm like, bro, we almost died. I know, but my wife, my chicks, you know. So I was thinking about that this week as I was coming here, and I was thinking, you know, I really was freaking out. I mean, fear gripped my heart. I, I was concerned that uh, it was going to be really bad. By the way, that's the final, that's the final uh, picture. It wasn't quite as big as, as maybe uh, I presented <laughs> But make no mistake about it, our world today is on fire. 
We have uh, a racial divide like we've never had before. We have uh, economic issues and peril. We have unprecedented political divide. Um, we, we've got uh, gun issues. And by the way, the number one gun issue in America, if you want to know what it is, is uh, a man that owns a gun is more likely to kill himself than he is anybody else. That suicide is more common than homicide for a man that owns a gun. We, we have sin issues. We have people who don't know who they are trying to figure out, uh, even in the church, there, there are churches that have forgot their message. There are churches that have forgot the gospel. There are churches that, you know, uh, are church in name, that they preach pop psychology. When I got here and I heard about the message series that you were in, you know, it's real popular today to have message series, it's, you know, like to have a four-week series on, you know, overcoming fear, and that, that's all good, or how to walk in health. And, but when I heard the message series that you all are going through, I don't know that I've ever heard of a greater message series in my life. I was, I was like, are you serious? Yes, we are going through the 27 books of the New Testament with our church so that they actually know who these, who these, you know, these gospels and these uh, epistles were actually written to, what had happened, what was going on in the culture of that time, what, what the goal was, and what God was saying to the church. And I thought, thank God that there are still churches that are preaching the scripture and preaching the Bible and preaching the gospel. But the world is on fire. And we have to be prepared to do something about it. And for some of us that are here this morning, it's even closer than that for us. That it's not just that the world is on fire. Our life on some level is on fire. That, that maybe you're in the throes of a marital breakup. Maybe, maybe you're like my friend who called last week and said, Blaine, pray for me. My wife left me. I'm alone. She's, she's filed for, for separation. And I said, why? Well, she just doesn't like me anymore. I said, there's nothing more than that. No, she just, she's found somebody else. So maybe you're feeling the, the fire of betrayal or the, the fire of brokenness. Maybe you have a, a son or a daughter that has gone off the rails. Maybe you're fighting through uh, some kind of sickness in your life. I don't know what it is. Or maybe like me, that you're suffering with an addiction right now, and it's a secret. Nobody really knows about it except for maybe a few people who, who know you really well, but you're fighting through this addictive challenge in your life. And I remember when that hit me 14 years ago, when finally my secret, addictive, painful, depressing life was exposed to my family, to my church, and to the world. And on one level, it was terrifying because I thought, I'm going to lose everything. It's all going away, and it did. It all went away. Relationship with my children my marriage, my career, my reputation, my church, everything was gone. But on the other side of that terrifying moment was grace. And it was like God was saying, I'm giving you a chance to put the fire out. And I was so depressed, friends, that I walked out of my home the second day after my exposure and it was Easter week of all, of all weeks. And I walked out of my home, walked through the fence, went to uh, right in front of our church, which was a three-lane, uh, uh, wouldn't call it a highway, but a roadway, very, very busy roadway. And I just started walking towards traffic, saying, God, take me. Cars are swerving and trucks are swerving. I mean, I am just trying to let God take me, and by some miracle, within 60 seconds, there were like at least three, I can't remember how many, but at least three police cruisers that pulled the stops, lights on, guns out, and they had me on the ground. They thought I was carrying a, a gun or something. They thought that I was going to hurt somebody. I, they didn't know. 
So long story short, took me home. They sent me to Phoenix, Arizona to rehab the next day. Put me on a plane, sent me to Phoenix. I stayed in a place, some of you know this place, it's called the Dream Center in Phoenix, Arizona, and then I would commute every morning at 6 in the morning to the rehab place, and then I'd come back usually about 8 o'clock at night and sleep in the Dream Center. Uh, Pastor Tommy Barnett opened that up for me to, to stay out while I was there. And I remember looking out in the Dream Center uh, window one night, and I'm looking out into the, into the evening, and I'm thinking what a mess I've made of my life and how awful it was. And the Lord reminded me what Phoenix stood for. So I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and he reminds me that a phoenix was an imaginary bird, according to ancient stories, that burns itself to ashes every 500 years, and then is born again. And the Lord spoke and said, Blaine, I am going to take the ashes of the life that you burned up, and you are going to experience a new birth or a resurrection. And there are some times that until the ashes come, we don't figure out that we need resurrection. And when Jesus showed up and he announced his mission and he began to speak and quote from Isaiah 61 and there's this beautiful uh, uh, metaphor of I'm going to give you a, a, a headdress for ashes or another translation, beauty for ashes or still another translation, a crown for ashes. What he's saying is I'm going to take and replace the lost and burned up parts of your life with a crown of new life, with a crown of resurrection, you're going to begin to live a life that you've never lived before. You see, Jesus doesn't do recovery. He does resurrection. Jesus didn't come as a, just a moral teacher. He didn't, in other words, he didn't come to make bad people really good. He actually came to make dead people really alive. He came to put something inside of us that would change us, that it's not this exterior mandate that you better start, you know, summoning your willpower to truly be a Christian. No, it is experiencing the Spirit of God, the new creating power of Jesus in your life, where all of a sudden there's something inside of you where you begin to live different because of what God's done. So there's this resurrection that he's got for those of us that are living in these ashes. And as I began to Ask God what that looked like and what that would mean in my life, what it would mean to resurrect out of ashes and to to begin to live into a new and a different life. And by the way, by God's grace, by God's grace, and I say this all the time, and his good community, I'm in my 11th year of complete freedom, complete sobriety, without any relapse, and and I hope that that uh, offering of praise is to God because it's all God. Because I spent 23 years on my own letting Blaine Bartell figure it out, and, and he was not able to figure it out. All the glory to Jesus. And so as I began to walk through this and say, okay, God, how, how are you going to bring my life up from, up from the ashes? He took me over to this passage that just became life-altering for me. And it's a story where Jesus grabs his 12 disciples one morning and he says, hey guys, we're leaving Galilee. We're going to go to this place called Caesarea Philippi. Now Caesarea Philippi was the wrong direction. (laughs) It was not on the way to Jerusalem, it was the other way. It was a pretty good journey, uh, about 20 plus miles, and uh, they weren't Ubering, they were walking. And so there's this pretty long trip, a good, good long day trip. And so they, they're heading to this place of Caesarea Philippi, and, and 
the, the culture and the, the thing that we should know about this is Caesarea Philippi in that day was known for some horrific things that were practiced. There was this rock area that they would practice these sexual rituals and festivals that would last a day, two, sometimes three days. But they were also religious. They, there was a spiritual element. They would worship all these gods. So, so when Jesus told his young followers, many of them in their teens, by the way, and said, we're going to Caesarea Philippi, this would be like, you know, Pastor Kurt announcing to the youth group, hey, we're going to Vegas. We're going to go to Vegas. It's going to be great. So I could just imagine as they were on the road and they're walking, they had a lot of time to talk. A few of the disciples are hanging back a little ways from Jesus who's leading the way and said, man, I can't believe we're going here. Man, if my mom finds out I am so busted, I wonder what we're going to see. What, what's going on? So, so we pick it up there. And it says in verse 13 of Matthew 16, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father that is in heaven. And I tell you that now you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Powerful, powerful stuff. I'm going to, in the last few minutes, I'm going to share three things that we need to wake up to as the church, that we need to wake up to as followers of Jesus. Number one, we need to wake up to who Jesus is. We need to wake up to who we are. And we need to wake up to who the church is. I don't think it was an accident that Jesus went 20-something miles to share this, this mission with his followers. It's interesting, Caesarea Philippi, there's no record of him doing anything else but asking this question. All the way there to ask the question, who do people say that I am? Didn't do any healing, no miracle crusades, no teaching, nothing else, just this question. And so Caesarea Philippi, the, the way you know you're there is you get to this rock area. And there's this rock that's literally 500 feet wide, about 100 feet tall, just huge, huge rock. And then there's a base rock below. And the base rock, as you uh, are on this base rock, you'll see these little carved out niches in the, uh, in the wall of this rock. And they would set idols in these niches. And during these festivals and these orgies and this, these sexual rites that they would do, uh, they, would, they would worship these, these false gods. And, and then there was this cave and actually, if you, if you go there, they have a sign and a name for the cave. But the cave, they believed in that day that evil, demonic uh, spirits came in and out of this cave. And that they would actually be possessed by these entities. That's why it was so crazy, some of the activities that they would engage in. And so they called this the gates of hell. So I wonder if Jesus knew that. <laughs> I wonder if he started making all these rock metaphors and the gates of hell. I wonder if he knew, maybe, that he was also speaking to this kind of culture and this kind of world. A world that was on fire with sin and brokenness and unbridled sexuality, indiscriminate sexuality, uh, targeting and, 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 uh, and objectifying 
men and women as just sexual beings. And, and all of a sudden, Jesus shows up in the most defiled, in the worst place that he could possibly find in the world at that time and said, this, upon this rock. I'm going to build my church. Now, I know that he was speaking when he said the rock. I know that there was this rock of revelation of the fact that he was the Messiah, the son of the living God, and that the church is built on that revelation. But I also believe that there was a dual meaning that he was saying on this rock, in places like this, when the world's on fire, guess what? My church is going to show up. And my church is going to do its work. And the gates of hell, every demon in hell, will not prevail against the work of my church. You see, Jesus, or Paul said in Romans 8, he said, the same spirit, we just celebrated Easter, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us and quickens our mortal bodies in Christ. I hope we can capture what resurrection is. It's not just that Jesus rose from the dead. It's that he rose from the dead and then gave us that resurrection power. That the same spirit that raised him up lives on the inside of us. And if every demon in hell could not stop Jesus from coming out of that grave, I'm telling you, every demon in hell cannot stop Jesus from doing his work in and through us, in and through us. So I want to very quickly share in the last couple moments the three things that we have to understand. Number one, who Jesus is. Friends, Jesus is the son of the living God. He's unlike any other man that, he ever, that ever lived. He is not just a good teacher. He was not just a good moralist. He was not, not just a nice guy. This guy was the son of the living God. Think about it. He built stuff out of wood for 30 years. That's all he did. Just lived in an, an, anonymity. He was anonymous. <laughs> No one really knew who he was, you know. And then all of a sudden, he shows up, and John the Baptist says, hey, look who's here. And, uh, and yet, he never wrote a book. Oh, there were books written about him. Never wrote a book. He never went to the office. <laughs> he never built a building. You'd think he'd build a building, right? No. Never traveled more than a few hundred miles away from home. Never engaged in politics or statecraft, but he challenged the powers that were in that day, promising to build a new kingdom and inaugurate a new king. And he believed somehow that he could change the world with fishermen and prostitutes and tax collectors. And 36 months after calling for this revolution of God's love and God's kingdom, the powers of Caesar and Rome apprehended him along with some of the religious leaders, and they executed Jesus at 33 years of age. His life was over, and you'd think the story would end there, but it didn't, because this was Jesus, the son of of the living God. And 2,000 years later, Christianity is the most dominant faith in all of the world. Jesus is still the king of kings, and Caesar is a $5 pizza. We need to wake up to who Jesus is and what he can do and that he is still alive in this world. We need to wake up to who we are. First thing Jesus did is reveal who he was, but then he, he woke Peter up to who he was. He says, you're not, you're not Simon anymore, which meant kind of curious, curious one, you know, question asker. You're not Simon anymore. No, you're Peter. Peter meant rock. He said, I'm renaming you. I'm reclaiming you. 
You are mine and you have new identity. You are going to live differently. You are going to act differently because I've come to live in and through you, Peter. We must know who we are. We are sons and daughters of God. We're beloved of the Father. We are called into his community. We have gifts that have been given to us by the Lord. We are members of his body and distinctly put into his body for reason and purpose. And the reason is pur- and purpose is not just to be here on Sunday and shout amen. That's a part of it. That's great. I appreciate it. But we are here to do a work. We're here to be engaged. We're here to know who we are and what our calling is as men and women, as young men and women, as children of God. And friends, there are too many believers today living in their past, living in their shame, living in their hurt, living in pain, and not realizing who they've become in Christ. Not realizing, as, as Pastor Kurt prayed blessing over you, not realizing that God speaks blessing over you. That he calls you saints of God. I'll tell you one of the life changing moments in my life in conquering my addiction was figuring out who I really was. Because I would go to my four 12-step groups a week that first year, every week, Monday, Tuesday, Friday night, Saturday morning, four a week. And I would get in that group. There would be 10 or 11, 12 guys in the circle. There would be our counselor. And we'd go around the circle at the beginning, beginning of every 12-step group, and we'd do our check-ins. And the check-ins all went like this. My name is Jim, and I'm an alcoholic. My name is, you know, Johnny, and I'm a, I'm a drug addict. My name is Blaine, and I'm a sex addict. That's how we checked in. Got to own your stuff. And I'm driving to Plano, Texas, to go to my group on Tuesday night, and the Holy Spirit says, you will never check in like that again. And he spoke to my heart, and he told me how to check in. And so I got in there, and I sat down, and I knew I was going to get hit hard for this. But it got around to me, and I said, hey, guys, great to be here tonight. I say this with humility, but I say it truthfully. My name is Blaine. I'm a forgiven son of the Father, I'm a blessed new creation of God, resurrected from my death, and by God's grace, I'm overcoming my past addiction. Yeah. And that's what they did. They were all like, yeah, you know, that's it. We're not who we used to be. We're not living into that monster that we used to be, that God has called us new creations. He's called us into resurrection that we're living into an imag- a new imagination of what life can be. And the last thing is that we need to wake up to who the church is. Because friends, this is it right here. This is life. That when Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I looked up that word church in the Greek because I'm a Greek scholar, not really, but, but I, do have a, I do have a computer with Google. And I looked up that word church, and it, it is a Greek word, and the Greek word is ekklesia. And if you translate that Greek word ekklesia into English, it is this, 501c3 with a big building. Wrong. It is actually this. God's called out ones that are gathered together for his mission or assignment. It was a a Roman word that they used to describe men and women that were called out by Rome onto an important committee to change something in Rome, to bring some kind of transformation 
in the nation of Rome. And Jesus grabbed that word and said, no, this is where transformation is going to happen. This is where change is going to happen. Is I'm calling out these ones that are going to come together and, and the gates of hell will not prevail against their mission. Listen, there, there is, can I, can I tell you this? There is no solo Christianity. There, there is no, for those that are participating online, we're so glad that you're, you're with us this morning. So glad that you're, 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 you're being a part of this. But, but if you're watching at home on your computer or on, on television or whatever, come, come, get in your car, come, be, experience this. Experience the community and, 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 and the before and after of our gatherings where we're intersecting and we're praying together. And we have this time that we'll have in just a couple minutes where we just take the very end of our gathering and allow Jesus to do his work in our life. It may be receiving the body and blood of Christ in communion. It may be lighting a candle for somebody we love and we're praying for. It may be coming and receiving prayer from a prayer partner. It may be just worshiping and listening to the Holy Spirit. But this is what God is building right here. And I wouldn't be here without this. I wouldn't be here without so many pastors and churches that invested in my life. And I began to find out that I could trust brothers and pastors with my story. And that I would be loved and I would be helped and I would be supported and ultimately resurrected. Listen, you can trust the church. You can trust Victory Church with your story. You're not too far gone for Jesus to resurrect you. Bow your heads, close your eyes if you would for a moment. If every head is bowed, eyes are closed right now, you say, Blaine, I don't know if I'm right with God. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't know that my sins are forgiven. Or perhaps you've asked Christ into your life in the past, but somehow you've fallen away and you're not where you used to be, and you need to come home. You need to come back. I want to look all over this place. I'm not going to have you come forward. won't embarrass you in any way. But if you say, yes, that's me. I need Christ in my life. Or maybe you're at one of our campuses, and you're, you're, you're right there in your seat at that campus, and you say, yes, that's me. I need Jesus in my life. I want to be resurrected out of my old life. Would you raise your hand all over this place? Just throw it up as high as you can. And a hand raised just simply means pray for me. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? Lift your hand very quickly. Just put it up. Put it down. We'll pray for you. God bless you. Another one at the back. God bless you. At the campuses, raise your hand. Thank you. Well, Father, I thank you for each and every one of these men and women that have responded to you that are crying out to you. And I thank you in this moment that you're meeting with them. You're wrapping your arms of love around them, that you're resurrecting them out of their ashes. And they're rising to a new life. We thank you for it. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Let's give the Lord a good shout of praise for all these people. Amen. Thank you so much, Blaine. Uh, what a powerful truth from God's word. If you're one of those that raised your hand and said, hey, I'm putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I have a gift for you. It's just a little book. But more importantly, I'd love to start a conversation with you. After the service, I will be out in the lobby underneath the next step sign. I'd love to see you. I'd love to place this in your hand and help you take your next step. Every week we get an opportunity to hear truth from God's word. Our pastors have led us so well in that. And we have an opportunity once again today to step in as Blaine shared with us, to take a whole bunch of steps in connecting and having communion or worship through our, our, our giving, stewarding our resources well, taking the, the, the tithe and an offering and giving it back to the one who gave everything for us. What a beautiful opportunity. But I wanna tell you what, if you came in here today, as many did, well, let me say this this way, all of us came in here broken. Many of us have been resurrected, but you know what? 
we still have stuff. We, we still live in this thing called flesh. We still have issues. We're not completely like Christ every moment of every day. Hallelujah, that'll happen, right? But all of us carry that brokenness, that mark of that sin nature that is struggling against the spiritual side in us. And there's a battle every day that we either submit to what God wants or submit to ourselves. And so we have a choice to respond. And can I tell you what, as, as Blaine was sharing about his brokenness, I went to my own brokenness, the stories that I've heard from you and your brokenness. I want to tell you, there is a cross that makes a difference in everything because Jesus loved you so much as he beautifully shared with us that he not only died, was buried, he rose again to give us new life and the Holy Spirit that allows us to have that power, that wonder-working power that changes us. And in the middle of change, there's a step forward and sometimes there's a step back, but it's the reality of where we are. And so can I encourage it? Run to the cross. Write the stuff that you're struggling down with. None of us are perfect. You'll see our pastors actually go there and we stick stuff. All of us have the opportunity. Our prayer partners would love to put their arm around you and go before a God that loves us and intercede on your behalf. All the steps of taking and stepping in and responding well, we have an opportunity to do well. The verse will come upon the screen here in just a second and you'll have an opportunity to respond. Can I encourage you from my heart? Take your next step and let's do this together. the good
every season, every step. That good God has good things for you. And I want to tell you what, some of those good things, I just want to tell you what, he loves you so much. He wants to make a difference in your life and he gives us the privilege of carrying that. So on your way out today, can I encourage you to stop by the Align Life Ministries table out in the lobby, speak with Angie, sign up for group leader training that's happening here on the 5th. And then as you leave, make sure, go make a difference with your life. It's precious. And that good God who has good things for you will pursue you with all of his goodness. We love you, church. God bless you. Have an awesome day. We'll see you later.